You know, as we were worshiping this morning and I was looking around the room and just taking you in and enjoying just being able to worship you this morning, there were, there were a few things that I saw in the room that I thought, I, I don't know, if you had told me 12 years ago, 10 years ago that these would be a reality, I would not have believed you. Um, you could say the same about me, but Julie, if I ever, Julie, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> If you had told me 10 years ago that you'd be sitting in the front row of church, I would be shocked that you would be serving in the Connect Cafe. Someone called it the Snoopy last week, which I loved. Um, and I mean, Rick, why don't you make yourself comfortable? Put your foot up on the chair in front of you. Rick had a knee operation on Friday and is here today. So Rick, thank you for being here. Uh, that is just so amazing. You know, as I was preparing um, for this word this morning, I thought, obviously, I mean, my, my primary role for the last number of years here has been to lead worship. And so I wanted to bring a word about worship. And so for two weeks, every day I spent hours, I really, um, Rian would use the word crafted a message about worship to leave with you. And then Thursday night, I couldn't sleep. Um, and and the, the scriptures are going around my mind and memories are going around in my mind. And, and I just, I had a sense on Thursday that I needed to preach a different message. And so on Friday morning, I said to Tim, I'm going to change my message. And she said, oh, Mark, please don't. <laughs> just, just be normal, I guess, is what she was trying to say. But I think where it comes from is that as a worshiper, and if you're a worshiper, I don't mean a worship leader, I don't mean someone that sings on stage, but just as a worshiper, if you are someone who loves being in the presence of God and worshiping, um, the Psalms probably have a special place um, in your heart. The Psalms are songs of praise, they're songs of worship, they're songs of lament, they're, they're songs that are just so real. And as you go through the 150 Psalms, it feels like a bit of a roller coaster as you read those, but they are such a mirror image, I think, of what life looks like. And if you want to understand God's heart for his people, and if you want to understand the heart of God's people for their God, then the Psalms is where you need to make yourself at home, and the Psalms is where you need to be comfortable. And so today I want to speak um, simply about um, the things that that God has placed on my heart over the last couple of years um, and, and share with you specifically um, from, from a psalm. And so I want to take us to Psalm 37. We're going to read um, verse 3 to 6. And this is what it says. It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land. In other words, the land that God has given you, the land that, where, the place where God has set your feet. You will live safely in the land and you will prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. The justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. This is a passage a psalm that I have returned to so many times in my journey of life, especially in light of verse 4, which says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you uh, the, the desires of your heart. I think it's the NIV that says He will grant you the desires of your heart. And different versions say it differently, but verse 4 is actually a really great verse for those of you who like to do what Rian mentioned earlier, just pick a scripture out the box and use it however you want. So if you want God to be your genie, if you want to rub your Bible and have some magic thing happen where everything you get, you, like verse four is a great verse to take out of context. Like God will just grant me whatever it is that I want. But that's actually not at all what it's about. And I was reading a few commentaries on this verse and I found one that, that said, said it so specially. It said this, some people might interpret this to mean that God will grant anything and everything we desire if we delight in him. However, it is essential to understand this promise in light of the first part of the verse, that as we delight in the Lord, our desires begin to align with His will. Psalm 37 verse 4 is not about God giving you whatever it is that you want. Psalm 37 verse 4 is about you aligning your heart with the heart of God. In John chapter 15, where it speaks about being connected to the vine, there is, there is such, a, such a mirror image of John 15 in Psalm 37 verse 4 that as we align our hearts with the will of God, what I've found so many times in my life and what I know to be true is that those desires um, that God grants you, they're actually desires that He puts on our hearts. And we, the, the commentary continues and says, our hearts are transformed. 
we start to desire the things that are pleasing to God and in harmony with his plans that have been put in our heart. And so if you want to look at Psalm 37 verse 4 and you, and, and you want to speak about the thing that God puts on your heart, you can use a, a variety of words this morning. You can speak about the calling that God has on your life. You can speak about the passion that God places in you. You can speak about purpose. Um, but for the purpose of this morning, I just want to call it um, living the dream. I've got a friend who uh, I'll message him and I'll say, he lives in London now. And I say, hey, Q, and how's it going? And nine times out of 10, he replies, just living the dream. Because because that's what it is. That's what, that's what we pursue. We just want to live um, the dream. And when I thought about this morning, when I thought about this word, when I thought about my journey over the last, um, the last 12 years or so, I thought God, is, God has protected me for 21 years in ministry. And even before that, where I've, I've been living the dream. And the dream for me started when I was a teenager, um, grade eight. I, I grew up in a Christian home. And, but then we moved to East London, um, which is not the promised land at all, regardless of what um, some people will say to you. Um, we moved to East London, and we started going to a church called Quigney Baptist. And I came from, from a tiny little town called, called Kumacha. Um, don't try to find it on the map. It's, I mean, you really got to zoom in. And, but I came from a tiny town, and we went to a small church. And if I remember correctly, our church didn't even have services every week because one week it was the Baptists, the next week it was the Methodists, the next week it was the Anglicans. You'll be pleased to know that we were Baptists. But then we went to Island, we went to Quigney Baptist Church, and I walked into this church, and it was like, Wow. Worship was incredible. They had like a full band and big sound, and, and they had a choir. And I remember, I remember the dream started. God granting the desires, placing a desire in my heart. And I thought as a 13-year-old boy, I would love to be up there. I would love to be part of, part of what this band is producing. And that, and that was a dream. And then I um, took the step and I auditioned um, to join the worship team. And when I think back, I, I wanna, I'm embarrassed about that audition because I don't read music. So I went to the audition, and the lady, uh, the lady worship pastor put the, the sheet music in front of me and said, okay, we'll play this song. And I saw the title of the song, and I was like, I know this song. This is, this is a good thing. And so I played the song. Do you know that there are some songs, there are more than one song that have the same title? So I played the completely wrong song, but I played it really well. <laughs> so... So I joined the team, and that is the dream. And I was living the dream. I was living Psalm 37 verse 4. And then as I, was, as I was serving, as I was volunteering, and as I was on stage, and I was going to rehearsals, and I was getting to know a bit more about church, and the dream grew. And I, and I started to go to youth ministry, and I thought, God, what would it look like? What if, what if I could be um, responsible for these young people? What if I could go into ministry and serve you in this way? And so... A couple of years after that, an opportunity opened up. Um, my, my, my life journey as a teenager was an interesting one, but at the right time, at the right place, um, a, an opportunity opened up for me um, at Quigney Baptist as a youth pastor. And so I was actually in Joburg at the time, um, studying, um, doing a one-to-one, it was called one-to-one program through the Baptist Union. And Quigney called me back. And I went and I got to live the dream. I was a youth pastor at, at the biggest Baptist church in the country with the best worship. And I thought, this is the dream. This is, this is what God has for me. And after a few years, um, I started thinking, but, but God, what if, what if there's more? What if beyond leading youth ministry and playing the piano, and what if, what if I could step into a new role, a new dream that you have for me? And I remember the day... Um, our senior pastor there, his name was, you know, Paula taught me something. If you're going to cry, you just do this. <sighs> and then everyone laughs at you, and then you're not emotional anymore. Um, so, so I remember the day um, our senior pastor called me upstairs um, to the office. You know, there were the downstairs offices. That's where the youth pastor was. And then there were the upstairs offices. And he called me to the upstairs office and he gave me a key and he said, you know, this office um, is the office of the associate pastor. But it's your office now. So we're going to get a new youth pastor. And so that was, wow, I was living the dream. Psalm 37 verse 4, God has taken me into a new season. And God is birthing something new. And in that time, a big part of my role 
was um, Quickney Baptist Church used to be very instrumental um, in the country in organizing big conferences called Progress Conference. If you want to have a good chat with Rion about some of his special moments, ask him about progress. Um, and I was very involved in those conferences, and I got to work alongside the biggest churches in the country because we used to share um, guest speakers. So how it works is is a, a preacher that comes to South Africa and will preach at a couple of churches, and so those churches split the airfare and that kind of thing. And one of the churches that I got to work with was Rama Bible Church in Joburg. And so I went to Rama, and I walked in, and at that stage, um, Rama had the most incredible worship in the country. I think they were one of the only, if not the only, um, worship band that were recording albums um, that were really putting South African songs into the heart. And if you want to go down a journey, um, go onto YouTube and search for Praise Africa. But just, it's very cringe now. Just take yourself back 20 years and then you'll appreciate it. And I stood at Ramo with 7,000 other people and I looked at the stage and I thought, wow, God, what if the dream in my heart is changing? What if I could be part of this, part of this community and part of what you're doing in worship here? And then December 2010, I remember the moment walking onto the stage. <laughs> walking onto the stage at Rayman, and I stood behind a piano that today costs a lot more than, than, than what it could be afforded. And I stood and I looked at this empty auditorium on a Thursday night and I thought, well, this is a dream. This is the dream. This is what God has for me. This is the Psalm 37 verse 4 moment for me. And then a while later, and so we got to worship at Rama, and we got to be part of a great team there. And then a while later, I got a phone call uh, from this guy in Pretoria who wanted to meet with me. And um, he really wanted to impress me. So he said, let's meet at McDonald's. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and I paid. <laughs> Well, it was like seven rand. <laughs> and so Rian and I met at McDonald's um, in, on uh, Malibongwe Drive, and Rian shared the dream. He shared what, what Eastside was about and what the heart of Eastside was about. And so um, Tam and I took a, a Sunday off at Rayma, and we came through to Eastside. The stage was still there, and I walked in. My first impressions were, I've never seen so much brown in all my life. The curtains are brown, the walls were covered with brown hessian, the stage was brown wood, the floors are brown. I was like, wow. My, my, so my first thought was, God, if you ever call me, we need to change the colors. I think we've done okay. <laughs> um, I've never seen so much. <laughs> Someone got a mirror. <laughs> so so then, then this became the dream. I thought, God, what if, what if we could... What if we could take Eastside's worship and, and transform it into a kind of worship environment and community where, where God's people long to be in his presence, where people sing out like you sang this morning, and where we can use technology because I'd, I'd been at Rama, which was like 20 years ahead of everyone else. And what if I could take what I've learned here and do something at Eastside? And that is the dream. And we've done something. And I thought, oh, well, God, what if, what if there's more? And then so my role at Eastside over the last couple of years has changed. And I remember walking around the property saying, God, what if you'll trust me with this? What if, what if this is what you have for me? What if this is my Psalm 37 verse 4? And then at the beginning of 2023, um, Janine Price, who was our worship pastor at Rama, she called me and she said, there is, there is a songwriting group that is coming out of COVID during, you might remember during COVID, there was 24 hours of worship on Facebook um, for, many, for many months. And so I was part of that group where six o'clock in the morning was typically my slide. I'd lead worship on Facebook for an hour and there were, there were hundreds of people. And out of that, the songwriting group has formed and, and the mission is to write songs that the South African church can sing. And so we sung um, one of them here at Eastside, which is Break the Bread, that communion song. And Janine said, we've got a songwriting retreat why don't you come along? And I went there, and, and for the first time ever, I got really excited about writing songs. And I thought, God, what if this is a dream? What if this is um, the season that you have for me? And in that, in that period, um, two people in that group, Janine Price and CJ, who you might know, um, is a pastor down in Jeffreys Bay now. He's a rapper. They started speaking um, 
into my life and they're saying, you know, God is putting a new dream on your heart and you need to just press into what that looks like. And I thought, yes, these charismatics. Um, and then what happened is things are stirring in my heart. And we went to Israel in April. Um, my, my favorite group of people um, that I've been to Israel with in 2023. See what I did there, Julie? My favorite Israel tour of the year. Um, and we came back and um, I went to another songwriting retreat with this group in Franschuk. And, and CJ, now if prophecy freaks you out, just take a sip of water, whatever. But CJ said to me on the last morning, he said, Mark, uh, it wasn't Janina, it was the leader of the group. We just we want to minister to you. We want to prophesy over you. And I'm, I'm open to anything because I've got discernment. And if someone says something that's nonsense, I just leave it behind. And CJ said, Mark, I don't know what this means, but, but there is a theological future that God is putting on you. And I thought, well, I mean, I'm a pastor. Obviously, there's a theological future, like silly thing. Three days later, I have a conversation with BTC, which is a theological college, and now that's the dream. And so this has been, for me, a fascinating journey of going from the dream to the dream to the dream to the dream. A fascinating journey of going from what God has placed in my heart to the next thing that God has placed in my heart. So when I speak about um, the dream and this conversation that I want to have with you today, I think I'm qualified because I've been through it. I've been through what it looks like to be in the purposes of God. And I've been through what it looks like to walk in the will of God. And I've been through what it looks like to, to just follow the heart of God. And so I want to speak to you about the dream. I want to speak to you about what God has placed on your heart. And I'm going to share um, a couple of things. And because I'm going into a Baptist environment... I want to honor you this morning by bringing you a three-point alliterated sermon. Um, I'm practicing. And I want to start here. You know what? This is where you start. You've got a dream. I wonder when last um, you have sat down and taken time to think about the passion and the heart of what God wants for you. I wonder when last you've had the opportunity to say, God, this this is the Psalm 37 moment for me. I know it was Martin Luther King. I think it was Martin Luther King who is known for saying, I have a dream. Well, he might have said it, but it was Yahweh, the God of the universe, your creator who places that dream in your heart. And I think one of the scriptures I've quoted the most from the stage is John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life to the full. How many of you know that Jesus did not come and die on the cross, and raise again, and go to be with God in heaven, and send the Holy Spirit so that you could just exist. I think it's an insult to the calling of God in our lives, and we just exist. But rather, God places a dream in the heart of man. He places purpose, and He places desire, and He places um, a drive that, that is only from God, not something that the world can offer, not something that comes um, from a place of, of naturalness. But I know that the world has this incredible ability of taking that dream and hiding it and squashing it down under the pile of washing and under the lunch bags that you have to make and under the commute to work and under the bills that you have to pay. And so by the time you get to the end of the day and maybe you think, well, I'm going to set some time aside to just dream and just find my Psalm 37 of his full moment. You're like, I've got nothing left. And so I'm going to sleep. And so, so if that's you this morning, if you're wondering, well, well, sure, Dan, if you're thinking, sure, I don't know what my dream is. Dan, you've got a dream. You have to dream. You have to. Because God has placed that in your heart. He has designed us to have a dream, to have a desire so that we can change the world. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. They may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If, you're, if life has put a bowl over the light of your dream, church, you've got to kick that bowl off. You've got to experience the joy of being in the will of God and, and doing that thing um, that God has called you to do. And so maybe what you need to do right now is actually take out your phone, open your notes app, and just start a sentence 
my dream is dot, dot, dot. And in the next couple of hours, or if today is really crazy, in the next couple of days, go back to that note and fill that in. What is the dream? What is God placing on your heart? What is the purpose and the passions and the calling that God has for you in this moment? Maybe it is to feed hungry children. Maybe it is to be a better parent. Maybe it is to go into ministry. I know of a place where you can study theology. Um, maybe it is, whatever it is, maybe it is to be a parent. What is that dream that God has placed in your heart? You've got to start with the dream. And so once you've started that journey and you've begun to dream, you have to steward the dream. The thing about a dream and a calling and a passion is that it actually takes work um, to turn into reality. Christian messaged me last night. This is Christian. Why don't you stand quickly? Because everyone needs to see. Um, this is Christian. At our staff breakfast on Tuesday, your name came up. And Josh was like, it's the best look, the best dressed guy at Atfield. So that's Christian. You can sit. <laughs> but honestly, I mean, Christian is just, you know what? Christian is just one of the nicest people um, you'll ever meet in your life. So if you don't know him, go, go meet him. But he messaged me last night and, and he said to me, um, how did your passion for leading worship and singing start? And so I answered him, um, and I told him how it started. And then he said, and then you later figured out that God gave you the gift. So my answer was yes, but I had to work towards it. Because most of the time, our gifts and our dreams, our abilities, our gifts and our dreams, they're intersect. And so 1 Peter um, 4 verse 10, is this to say, each of you should use whatever gift you received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. There is a graveyard down the road filled with gifts that were never stewarded, that never saw their potential because people never took that gift, that passion, that calling and stewarded it. They didn't do something with, with it that, that would honor God. And so being faithful with the dream God has placed in your heart means working at it. So for me, it meant rehearsing. It meant watching thousands and thousands of YouTube videos to figure out how to make tracks work, how to make media work, how to get the video on the screen. YouTube sh should be paying me uh, because I have kept them alive, but, but I've stewarded it. Um, it even means that, that I have a, a vocal spray. I mean, it sounds silly, but, but let me tell you, it's seven o'clock in the morning. I don't sound good. And so... I spray because it's a vocal spray and it's good. And so that's, that's something that, that I've got to steward. So if you look at the dream that God has placed on your heart, what is your next step? How do you steward what God has given to you? Maybe it means enrolling in a course. I know of a place where you can study theology. Maybe, maybe it means that you need to go and, and have a mentor. You know, Rick, I'm, our monthly breakfasts, are probably not going to happen as frequently. So if you're looking for someone with the most incredible amount of wisdom that you can sit with as a mentor, go and meet Rick. Um, because, because maybe you need a mentor. That is how you steward. Maybe you need to set time aside and go, you know what, Rian has spoken this morning about people at Eastside stepping up. Maybe the way that you steward the gift is to actually step out of your comfort zone and volunteer and get involved, whatever that looks like. But above all, when it comes to stewarding your gift, when it comes to looking after the, the dream that God has placed in your heart and doing the most of it, you must be faithful. God honors faithfulness, I think, above all else. And so in Matthew 25, we read the parable of the three servants. And, and, and you, must, you must know the story probably where they're given amounts of money and two of them in, go and invest them and the third servant takes it. He takes the gift, he takes the dream, he takes the provision that God has given him. It's a parable, and he, and he plants it in the ground. Some of you need to go home and get out a spade and dig out that dream and be faithful with what God has placed on your heart because this is what, this is what the master says to that servant who plants um, his, his harvest. It says this, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest in it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant. Give it to the one who has 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. 
But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't want that for you. I don't want Jesus as the master to be able to use those words for you because you haven't been faithful with the gift, with the heart, with the passion, with the dream, with the Psalm 37 verse 4 that God has for you. And so have a dream. Find your dream and then steward your dream and then surrender that dream. See the S's? Because whatever God places on your heart is actually never about you. My ministry is not about me. Abigail's ministry is not about her. Tam's ministry is not about her. Whatever God calls you to do, whatever he places in your heart, it's not about you, but it's about the glory of a God who is so worthy of us giving everything to him. Our dreams, our desires, our passions ultimately are about him. And so we have to, once we steward them, we have to surrender them, place them in the hands of God. Because when we hold on to our dream too closely and it becomes about us, we see what we're seeing so much in the world today, where God takes off the anointing. God takes away the grace. God takes away the influence. God takes away the pleasure of serving Him. God even removes the passion. And there are people um, in, in various places in life where they've made it so much about them that they can't even enjoy it anymore. Serving Jesus was never meant to be a chore. It was never meant to be easy. It was never meant to be a chore. There's meant to be joy, even in the suffering. So I love the words of Galatians 2 verse 20. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our dreams and our passions and our dreams and our gifting and our anointing and all of those things, they need to be crucified with Christ because we dream and we live and we have a passion, not for ourselves, but for his glory. Too often, um, have I skipped one? And then the last one, so you've got to savor the dream. Too often we spend far too much time looking at the past. Far too much time thinking about what was, about the dream that we had, about the role that we had, about the friends that we had. Or, or the opposite is we, we're so focused on what is to come and we're so focused on what the next season looks like and we're so focused on the next dream and we're so focused on the next moment instead of just savoring what God has for us in this very moment. There was a picture on Instagram um, this week of, I think it was at the Wimbledon final. You know, there's obviously a, a section where all the celebrities sit. And one of the tennis players, I know nothing about tennis. Um, I know that he was one of the tennis players because he had a tennis racket in his hand. I assume he was good. And all of these celebrities were standing there with their phones taking a photo of him. And it was David Beckham, I think David Beckham, that is just sitting there, just enjoying the moment. Not a phone in sight. All these celebrities. And here's this guy just enjoying the moment. Now, I'm usually with my phone out because I want to enjoy the moment now and later. But my point is, um, we, we aren't very good as a society at just enjoying the season that God has placed us in. And Ecclesiastes 3 verse 9 says this, What do workers gain from their toil? For I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the, in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy, to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all of their toil. For this is the gift of God. These verses come after the very well-known verses about um, there is a time for joy and there's a time to weep. There's a time to eat and there's a time to um, not eat. And there's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn. And then the scripture says, and God has made everything beautiful in its time. If I go back to Quigney Baptist Church now, which is not Quigney Baptist anymore, it's, it's called Calvary. It doesn't, it's not my home. It's not my season. It's not, it's not my passion. When I go back to Raymond now, I have, I have good memories, but it's not my season. So for the last 12 years, I haven't been longing for those seasons. I haven't been longing for what's ahead. I've been trying to just live in what God has called me to right now. Even today, 
Josh, who works in the office, has been incredible this week. He has said to me every day, Mark, on Sunday, just enjoy it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not thinking about tomorrow. I'm not thinking about Tuesday. I'm, I'm savoring this moment. I'm savoring your faces. Um, some of you are falling asleep, but I'm still savoring your faces. I'm savoring this moment. You know why? Because God has made everything beautiful in its time. And so maybe you're in a place where you feel like your season isn't beautiful, but God has made everything beautiful in its time. And he has placed that dream in your heart, on the heart of man. So here's what I want to leave you with today. I would honor, it would be an honor to have the privilege of praying for you and for your dream. Praying that God would reignite a God-breathed dream in your heart. A dream that you can steward and surrender and savor. And a dream that you can come back to in the days and the weeks and the months that lie ahead and say, that is, when I read Psalm 37, it's for that God grants me the desires of my heart. Man, God has placed a desire in my heart. So maybe this morning, this has been a difficult message for you because you don't have a dream. Well, let's trust God. Why not? Let's trust him to put something in your heart. Let's trust him to equip you, to be able to steward it, to surrender it, to savor it. So can I pray for you? Let me do that. Um, to bow your heads, and you can close your eyes, not because anything magic happens, because I want this to be a moment of focus. Lord, I believe that you do something and you place something in our hearts that is so much bigger um, than ourselves. I want to ask that today, on the 30th of July, 2023, that by your spirit, you would move around this room and you would speak into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls and that you would place a dream or you would ignite a dream or you would reignite a dream in our hearts, a dream that we can use um, to further your kingdom, a dream that we can use to change the world, a dream that is something we can come back to to know that you have placed eternity in the hearts of man. So I want to pray for every one of us. But I want to pray especially for those who might be struggling to find that dream or might be struggling to find what it is that you have called them to. I ask that you would speak clearly. I ask that you would ignite a fire in our hearts for what it is that you have for us and that you would help us to know that you have made everything beautiful and it's time. We surrender our gifts to you, Jesus. I pray for this church. I pray that you would use the gifts and the dreams and the passions that you have placed in our hearts to change the world, to further the kingdom, that the east side of today would not look like the east side of a year's time because people step up and do what you call them to do with their dream and their passion. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, thank you. Um, it really has been a privilege. Um, so Rian's going to come up now and just kind of take you through to the end. And then we, we're going to have a, a baptism service. Um, but afterwards, we're going to be out there. We would love as a family to have a photo with you. Um, so if we're standing around, why don't you come and just have a photo so we can remember you um, and think of all the good times. Thanks, Rian. Well, let's give Mark a hand. Thank you. So um, they're gonna get they're gonna get go and get dressed quickly. I just want to say that psalm has like got a special meaning to me because there was a blonded girl who had beautiful green eyes who was on the other side of the room one day, and I was praying. I said, "Lord, that woman." Um, and I read in the Bible. Really, this really happened. I read in the Bible, you know, that uh, you know. That passage, that God will give the desire of my heart. And she's been my wife for 36 years. So it's interesting that Mark read from that. So I, I just, maybe while they're getting ready, just, just think about it like this. Um, often we live in a world where we are told to pursue the dream. There's a book written about it. Um, a guy called Paul will... We'll, spend some time talking about 
when we go through our series in Philippians coming up in three weeks' time, um, had a dream to destroy the church. And then he had this Damascus Road experience where Jesus revealed himself. And his whole life turned around. And thousands of years later, we still talk about this guy called Paul. And um, just wondering if there's maybe somebody this morning, you've been chasing the wrong dream. And God is saying to you, like, it's time for you just to let it go. You're frustrated and you're angry and it's never working out for you. And God's going like, but I've got a better plan. Um, I've got my plan for your life. Just putting it out there. Let's pray and then I'm going to ask you guys, let's go around the baptismal pool um, and just remind people, I'm not avoiding people when I stand back from you guys. Debbie's um, quite vulnerable in terms of her immune system, so... Um, I'll be standing at a bit of a distance, staring at you. <laughs> but isn't it wonderful um, that Seth was born in the church, he's going to be baptized here this morning, eh? Isn't that wonderful? So cel- let's celebrate that. So God, we thank you for this word this morning, that you would um, also pray, Lord, that for those who are here this morning who need a Damascus Road experience, a revelation from you, they frustrate it, dreams never work out. Um, I pray that you would Put your dream in their hearts. Um, And then that you would give them the courage to pursue what it is that you're calling them into. Um, I pray that for our church, Lord. Let us never stand back. Let us always advance. But not with our dream, with your dream, I pray. And um, pray for little Seth. Lord, um, I pray for that, that boy that you would It is so obvious that you have your hand on him that this would be a defining moment in his life. And again, Lord, we pray for the Woodendals as they go to Baptist College. Years from now, may people call them blessed. May they thank God for them because of their faithfulness as you have challenged them to take the next step in their journey, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool, man. Let's go out there. Let's... let's, uh, let, let's see how Mark, sorry, oh, and I was just reminded to say, please go back and check your child out, um, because all of that stuff, it's not because we're trying to be smart, we're actually trying to be wise, because people are still children these days, we want to make sure the kids are all right, cool man, and if you're visiting here, come and join us at the guest area afterwards, okay. Bless you. So I know you're worried about the temperature, and despite Seth shivering, it's warmer in here than it is out there. (laughs) Thanks, Josh. (laughs) So I know um, sometimes when when children are baptized, some people might think, well, you know, isn't he young? Um, And I know that I'm his father. This is Seth. He's my son. (laughs) I know that Seth is, is my boy, but I have been absolutely astounded over the years to, to just see how Seth has honestly a genuine relationship um, with his father. And so, Father God, um, 
And so when Seth said to me that he would love to be baptized um, today in our last service, I said, heck no. <laughs> I'm not dealing with those emotions today. But I am. Um, and, I, and I wanted to share a story. And then I'll probably have to. But I want to share a story about a couple of weeks ago, um, just after the, the last news of um, on Debbie and how she's doing. In our lounge on the Sunday night, I sat with the family and I told um, Seth and Nate just what the doctors had said um, and that it was, it was terrible news. Um, and without, sk without sk skipping a beat, Seth said, well, the only thing we can do is pray for a miracle. And then without skipping a beat, he started praying and he prayed for a miracle. Um, <laughs> and that is the heart of this boy. Jesus is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for your sin, that you asked Him into your life to save your and Lord. But then baptize you, my boy, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Lord, I just, I thank you that in your word, we see your heart for children. And I thank you that for Tam and I, we have had the most incredible privilege of seeing your child's heart for you. And so as we celebrate as a church community, Seth's public declaration of faith this morning, I want to pray your greatest blessing upon him. I pray, God, that you would always grant him the desires of his heart, that his desires would always align with yours, that he would always walk in the will of God, that you would guard his heart, that you'd give him the strength of, um, the strength that, that only comes from the Holy Spirit, and that your anointing on him would always be clear. I pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if you want to swim, you're welcome to. <laughs> Um, maybe if we could just make a path over there for the children to go back to Kidsman. Um, and then parents, if you can fetch them and then come and enjoy the sun. Have a great Sunday.